This is the third part of the lecture for week number 11, Administering a Small Church. Uh, I told you there's some other priorities besides your personal organization. I spent all that time on personal organization because that's probably the first priority. But here's the second. Determine what this church uniquely is called to do. And there are, there are planning uh, formulas for that, which you can find, for example, in Tyson. And there are other things and tools that are available, but here's what you want to do. You want to determine what that congregation is uniquely called to do. Constantly conveying to your leadership and your membership that a church cannot do everything, and we really need to specialize. Let me give you a good example. A number of years ago, one of my uh, ministerial sons, Steve Whetstone, graduated from Weinbrenner, uh, was going to Weinbrenner, but while he was at Weinbrenner, became the pastor of the Zanesville, Indiana Church of God. A once large, proud church that supported missions out of which uh, missionaries like Victor Binkley and Donna Binkley came. Uh, support church for the Marco Medical Center that sent doctors to our clinics out there. But when he arrived, uh, after some very tumultuous times and divisive times in the church, the church had dwindled in numbers greatly. They really had no youth group left in the church, even though Steve especially was youth ministry, and there were not really that many young people to, to build upon. And so he began to explore what is important to this church, and one of the things that he found was important to them is that they were concerned about missions, and not just world missions, but community missions. He did some research, and he found that nearby in the local Methodist church, the Marco United Methodist Church, there was a very effective uh, food bank system program. But he also found that there were two things that were true. Number one, his church actually regularly provided food for that. And number two, that food bank system did not have sufficient volunteers. And so basically working with his church, they decided to make a priority, regular collections of food, but also to send volunteers to work in the medical center. And ironically, because so many of their members were really retired people, but still vibrant and vital with great skills, those people began to provide the meal planning counseling, uh, among other things, ways to help people work through the other systems to gain greater support. And after a while, the Zanesville Church of God became one of the critical volunteer staffs of the Marco, Medical, Marco United Methodist Church Food Bank. But that rebirth of energy, that rebirth of passion, and that focus on ministry helped that church begin to rebound in its self-esteem and to continue to grow. The second thing that you want to be concerned about is to do leadership training. Uh, you want to do leadership training often one-on-one -on -one because you can't really throw, have a big class. And by that, you begin to do this as frequently and consistently as possible. And I would say during your relational times, you're, you're visiting with people, getting to understand the people that are in your church, getting to understand uh, who they are and what they are able to do, you'll begin to discern some of the gifts and passions that they have, and perhaps you begin to do one-on-one -on -one training, beginning with simply discipleship that help nurture them to take on a greater leadership role. The third thing is to identify what programs, etc., are essential to achieving the mission of the church and ruthlessly resisting any attempts to add on, which generally leads to a dissolution of quality and often leads to more non-pastoral responsibilities for the one employee, which is you. So, does the church have to uh, have a vacation Bible school every year? Or does that not really contribute to what they're trying to accomplish? In other words, if you have a vacation Bible school, why do you have it? Have a clear perspective of why you have it, what you're trying to accomplish. Make sure you have the resources to do it, and then do it very, very well. But maybe a vacation Bible school may be your total children's outreach and therefore, you don't have a Wednesday night children's program. Those are the kind of questions and decisions you have to ask. I would also then say that you have to have a clear personal vision of your expectations. In other words, I have a sermon day. I have uh, my priority is to make sure the best thing that happens to you is in worship. And, and you begin to list those priorities. You communicate them first to your core church leadership. Let them dialogue with you. And frankly, if you need, based on the characteristics of that church culture, have to make some adjustments. Make the ones that you can do with integrity. But then make sure that the church understands 
This is why I do what I do. I don't just do things because I feel like it. I don't just do things because you ask me to do it. I do things because I believe this is the best way to provide leadership and shepherding to this congregation. Now, Tyson suggests at least three others. He says it is critical in a small membership church for the pastor to be involved in managing and leading worship planning. That is the number one spot in which you are going to connect with the congregation week in and week out. And it's also the number one spot where you often connect with new people who bother to come through the door of the church. So you want to make sure that the worship experience is top notch. And that doesn't usually happen by trying to do something simply week by week. One of the things that I have found, and Tyson actually recommends, is for the pastor a couple of times a year to take a planning retreat a couple of days away, which people will think you're just not on the job, but explain to them why you're on the job. But you spend a couple of days away and you pray, and reflect on the needs of the congregation, the messages that they need to hear, and begin to lay out a pattern for what you're going to preach about and what needs to be emphasized at certain times of the year, and put it into your planning grid. And maybe even make some initial plans for it. But that way, when the week comes in a small membership church, you may have some family crises that just wipe out your week. Or you may get sick like I did yesterday, and that wipes out a whole lot of things. Having that advanced planning gives you a way to keep stability and quality. We we'll also suggest that when you, Tyson suggests that for each Sunday, you want to plan one or two special elements. In other words, don't do the same service every week, but don't do a whole lot of different things so much that people are, are thrown off by it. For one or two special elements, communicate two things. Number one, if there's just one or two, like maybe having the youth sing one Sunday, or having one Sunday where uh, a certain group of people read the scripture for you instead of you, in other words, you, you begin to see those things. The one or two elements have some familiarity because the church is not, service is not so different week to week, but they also ex communicate a freshness and you may discover some new ways to worship well. And then they're just little details like, did you get the Palm Sundays for Palm Sunday? <laughs> did you get the Palms for Palm Sunday? Say, nah, <laughs> having one of those days today. I don't think it's the drugs I'm on because I haven't taken any today. But uh, you understand. He also says you need to be, think about leading and managing volunteers. We go back to something we've said over and over again, true in big churches or little churches. Job descriptions, job descriptions, job descriptions. Especially because so much is assumed or passed along in a congregation, and people work best if they know what the expectations are. Perhaps you design the job description with the first person that you inherit who has the job and grow from there, but have job descriptions. Continuing spiritual gifts exploration keeps opening a new vista for God to speak to people. And then, again, one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Uh, you need to be concerned with building safety systems and managing them. And uh, we've talked about a lot of those, and frankly, a lot of those are described by Welch, and I don't really need to repeat them, and, and Tyson imitates them. But he has a couple of things. Number one, he suggests that you have a policy for what you do when you're with a, alone with a person, a member in the church. I'm going to submit to you that uh, it's not a good idea, for example, for any staff member to be alone with a person of the opposite sex. In this day of Me Too and all those kind of things, it is for your protection and for theirs. Uh, at one point, my wife was doing some counseling with a counselor who required that she have she had to come in the evening because he did not have daytime hours that matched her work schedule. But his requirement was that when you come, please bring your husband or someone else who could sit just in the outer room. They don't listen to what you say, but the fact of the matter is that we know that there's someone there. And I would suggest that you, you begin to think about what is appropriate to be alone with people in the church. Come to identify that and then communicate that. Communicate that. Practice it. He also says that one of the biggest issues of building systems is what we call the building usage profit, uh, policies. Because quite often people say, well, I like to have this for my Sunday school class. Now I'd like to have this for my fifth grade uh, kids' uh, Bible uh, birthday party, we start to get all these things would begin to fill up the church, but also begin to bring a lot of people in who, because you've just said you can use it, don't understand that there's some rules for using it. Like, do you tear out the pulpit to do certain things? Uh, 
Are you allowed to nail things into the wall that may forever change things? And if you don't have somebody there to supervise that, people may be nailing things into walls that are going to create crises down the road. In other words, have some really clear building policies. And particularly small churches, alarm systems, make sure you have them. And last but not least is managing your financial and reporting systems. It is critical in a smaller membership church because you are the pastor and you're the person that people think knows everything that on finances, you know everything. Now, I'm not going to go back to the debate about you know what people give, but you need to know what is being spent and how it's being spent and how it's being accounted for and how it's being counted. You need to know those things. People will raise the questions about expenditures, etc. You should be informed of those things. And expenditures not be made that you're not aware of. Secondly, uh, and, and the second reason for that is sometimes some of our members have just ways of doing business that are just not quite the best way to do it. And if you're aware of what you do, what's going on, you can correct those, hopefully. Secondly, you want to make sure that you're always uh, promoting proper reporting to the IRS, which includes the reporting of giving. There are rules that IRS expects you to keep, and because you have that tax exempt status, you need to keep them. For example, donations given at the end of the year have to be, if I understand correctly, uh, at least calendar dated by postmark, not by check date, of when they've been given. And people given late have to put them in the next year. And then uh, I'm going to say one last thing. Work with a treasurer bookkeeper. Small churches have part-time treasurers who often have other jobs, have other priorities. They don't always get the bills paid on time. They don't always get them paid quite in the way that need to be done. And all you really need to do is have a phone call from some vendor who says, you know, Pastor, you know your church has not paid me for this for 12 months or even a couple of months. Quite often a local church, a smaller church, depends on relationships in the community in particular and the fact that you're even late on paying works against your reputation in the congregation. So you want to work with that bookkeeper to help them where they need help to get things done. And I would say give them help where they need to get things done, but make sure that they are doing the books of the church, particularly paying the bills in a timely, timely manner. Obviously, there's a whole lot more we could say. But I hope what I have to share with you today will be a strength for you as you administer a small church.